love him. Amen. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Take your seats in the presence of the Lord. Uh, we are doing the transition. Uh, next Sunday, come back and you'll see what we will show you. We couldn't do this transition without hiccups. Okay, so let's go. This is not a, an excuse for sloppiness. Okay, not an excuse at all. There was something wrong, but we've corrected it. Let's ride on. Now, the first scripture is from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 to 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 to 2. We're still discerning our hour of visitation. Discerning the hour of visitation. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians, sorry, chapter 6, verse 1 to 2. As God's, can we all read together? This is a new change in the instruction this morning. Can you read, if you can, if you can see the scripture, can you read all, let's read together. As God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. For God says, at just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I have helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. You notice the words time there in that scripture is the Greek keros. We're going to learn some words today. Keros. Oh, he says, God says, I beg you, World Mission Christian Fellowship, not to accept this grace, the grace of God that brings salvation. Do not accept it in vain. Do not accept it and forget and go back to work like a normal person. Don't live today and go to back on Monday to Friday and live your life like somebody who, who has not received the triumphant, victorious life in Jesus Christ. He said, do not ignore it. Do not ignore it because it's possible to ignore. Because, and then at the right time, Kairos, the word Kairos, take note. Are you students today? Kairos, that word Kairos, we're going to use it a lot today. We're going to explain what it means and we're going to use it. So what did you hear today? The, today is your day of salvation. And what did we hear about salvation? It's an all-encompassing word. Salvation is not just to forgive your sins so that you go to heaven. That's part of it and it's great. Salvation includes also your finances, your pocket. Salvation includes deliverance from curses. Salvation includes what? It includes peace of mind, the peace of God that bypasses all understanding. Salvation is an all-encompassing word. In this scripture, it's called soteris. And I don't want to bother you with so much Greek terminologies. I give you only the one that is necessary. Kairos. We've seen the word kairos. Second scripture. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11. Can you read with me again? I have observed something, under, something else under the sun. The fastest runner does not always win the race. And the strongest warriors doesn't always win the battle. The wise sometimes go hungry. And the skillful are not necessarily wealthy. And those who are educated don't always lead successful lives. It is all decided by chance. By being in the right place at the right time. Take note. If you are a believer, you know that the, in the world they use the word luck. You are lucky. Yeah, the people in the world are lucky because they don't have any covenant for any blessing. So when any good things happen to them, they are lucky. Because it's not founded on any, they have no agreement, no contract for good things to happen to them. So they are lucky when things happen. If a believer also talks, says that they are lucky, first of all, they are despising what was purchased. What they have, our blessings were purchased by the blood of Jesus. So how can you say it's luck? You, so you're taking the blood of Jesus for granted. That's why if you use the word lucky, I, I'm lucky as a believer. It's an insult to the Holy Spirit. And that is blasphemy. Some people don't know what blasphemy means. Let me begin to tell you people, seriousness when you say things. They say with your words, you, with your mouth, you enslave yourself. With your mouth also, you deliver yourself. So we are not lucky. When Ecclesiastes, this man in the Old Testament says that by chance everything happened to them, we know that he's the one who wrote all the wisdom literature. He was talking here about wisdom. It's wisdom that positions you in the right place at the right time. And that wisdom, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. So, 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 take note what is here. It's not the way the man in the world will read this and understand. It's not just luck. It is chance here is the working of the Holy, or Holy Spirit in bringing wisdom so that you are positioned at the right place at the right time. 
So there is a time for everything. Discerning your hour of visitation means that we need to really understand the notion of time. We need to understand the notion of time. Let's go to scriptures again and see other scriptures that talk about time. Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 15. Can you read with me? Let's read scripture, the habit of reading scripture. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 15 to 16. It says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. But like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. You know what the King James says? The King James says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. He said, redeem the time. He said, don't be like fools. It means be. It's possible. And you think I'm lying? Matthew chapter 25, we heard of 10 virgins there. We were waiting for the lamb. They were waiting for their groom. A picture of the rapture, the church waiting for the rapture. There were 10 of them. Five of them were wise. They had enough oil in their lamps. Then they said, let's go get some oil. Then they walk around. They couldn't find any store open to buy oil. Then they came to the people who had prepared the oil. Yeah, they said, ah, I know what. I don't know how long this evening is going to last. I have not for you. Sorry. I love you, but I'm not. So am I already preaching to someone right now? Where you take some stuff and give to some people? When, no, 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 no. no. My advantage moment is now. If I give you some of my oil, I might not make it to do. No, 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 no. Go, back, go find your own. What happened? That five, those five missed out. By the time the groom came, they were all wandering looking for oil. They missed the party. They were foolish. You see why it is so important to understand. Oh, when I look at these things, uh, I wonder how the notion of time, God was so serious about it, so much so that he even subscribed Jesus to, Jesus had to subscribe to the notion of time. Time was so important that even our Savior, Jesus Christ, who came from heaven, the man from heaven, the heavenly man, still had to obey and subscribe to the law of time. Here's what Jesus said. Let's go to scripture. We love scripture. Let's use scripture today. Love scripture. John chapter 9, verse 4. You want to read with me again the tradition of reading. John chapter 9, verse 4. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can walk. Who was talking? Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, he said that sometimes he will not be able to do some things. I thought you said he can do everything. I thought you said that. He says sometimes there's going to be a time where I cannot do anything. He says, is Jesus the one saying that? Is it Jesus is saying that? Do you believe that he's the one saying that? <laughs> okay. So he was also conscious that there could be some time in that his ministry. If at the age of 12 years... When Jesus was responding to his parents, where have you been? He said, really? So you didn't really know why I came? You asking me where I, am, where I was? If Jesus at that time was going to go tear down that temple in Jerusalem at that time, you know that you would have messed up things for yourself? You would have blown up the thing. He had blown up our redemption because there was a time for everything. Jesus at 12 years old could not go to the cross. He needed to stay for almost 18 years. Nobody knows him. Where is he? In, in the Bible, no people can tell what was happening to him. Some said he was working in his father's carpenter shop. Blah, blah, blah. But 18 years of Jesus' life, nobody knows. And this is somebody, voices have spoken. Two prophets have announced about him. 18 years, nowhere to be found. He knew the value of time. So when the time came for the three and a half years, oh boy, the guy could not rest. He, he walked, he sometimes even forgot how, when to eat. He forgot. He sent his disciples, go get me some food. By the time they came, he was doing something else. And they said, oh, Master, he said, no, I'm no more hungry. <laughs> he was so busy about time. Time, 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 my friends. Time. There is a time. For everything. In the realm of the spirit, what I have, the message I have for the people at World Mission Christian Fellowship and those watching me online, this message is this. Every time is not a God moment. Every time is not a God moment. If you are making the idea that there's always been time, I'm going to do this at this time. Oh, the, the, the Bible gave some proverbs, some illustration in the Bible, how somebody was making provision for himself. He said, I'll put this in this and put this so that when I retire, I have all that I have for, for my retirement and all of that. The Bible says, you fool, tonight, your soul is desire of you. Tonight. So all is planning. That's what the, the wise man said that 
man makes a plan, but God <laughs> does what? Okay. Ecclesiastes. What did he say? So in the realm of the spirit, my friends, every time is not the right time. If you were taking notes, these are wisdom things. Oh boy. Wisdom things that you, you need to stay with the Lord for a long time to get them. Every time is not the right time. The, to everything, there is a season. And there's a time for every purpose under the sun. Isn't it what Ecclesiastes tells us? There's a time for everything. And Jesus had that huge sense of urgency. When he was here on the earth, he said, I must do the works of him that sent me. Before it is night and no man can work. Oh, let's go. We are going to my team now, to my sermon. Friends, do you know the second time in the Bible where it is recorded that Jesus wept? You know that in all his ministry, there were only two times that he wept in Scripture. You all know the famous one, one John uh, eleven thirty five or something, when he looked at Lazarus' tomb and he wept, right? But what you neglect is that there was another time Jesus wept. He wept over the city of Jerusalem. Why did Jesus weep over the city of Jerusalem? What made him weep over Jerusalem, the people living in Jerusalem? Was it because of their lack of love or the, the lack of faith? Or is it their pagan practices? Or what was it? Is it because they relied so much on the law instead of grace that it was beginning? What was it that made Jesus weep over the city of Jerusalem? Let's find that in Scripture. Luke chapter 19. You want to read with me again? Let's read together. Luke 19 from verse 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. You see that? He wept over it. Then they go to verse 43. For the day shall come upon thee, that thy enemy shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee around, and keep thee on every side. And they shall lay thee even with the ground, and their children within thee, and thou shall not, and they shall not live in thee one stone upon one another, because of what? Because that knowing not the time of their visitation. Jesus is weeping over the inhabitants of Jerusalem because they did not know their hour of visitation. Oh, 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 is that enough to make him weep? Why would Jesus, the Lord of heaven, why would he weep? The man who could change every circumstance. Why would he weep over for the fact that the people would not know their hour of visitation? Is that a subject of weeping? To you, is that what you weep? If you visited World Mission Christian Fellowship as an apostle from another church to come see the spiritual help of the believers at World Mission Christian Fellowship, and you notice that they were not able to discern the hour of the Lord's visitation, will you weep over the World Mission Christian Fellowship? Believers, that's what is happening here. He wept over them, for they knew not their hour of visitation. World Mission Christian Fellowship. May the Lord not weep over us today for the same reason. May the Lord, I prayed for you that may the Lord not weep over you also for this same reason that you knew not the hour of visitation. Why are today's believers so callous in their misuse and misuse of time? They are so callous. But I think the wisdom of things that are happening in the world do not even ring a bell. Have you seen a man that's dying, somebody on their dying bed? What is it that they ask for most when they are on their dying bed? The doctors have already given them the ticking clock, those of you hospice situations, before they release them to hospice. You know, what is the prayer of somebody on his dying bed? Are they asking for more well? That they should win, they should sign a big God, they should sign me that contract, that federal contract. To be approved. Somebody who is wanting to die. Is that what he's praying for? What is he praying for on their dying bed? More time. Okay. More time sounds good. But what kind of time for what? Time to be at work? Would they, are they regretting that they should have spent more time at work? No. Some people, maybe at their dying bed, they wish they would have worked till 8 p.m. instead of 7 have you seen anybody like that? They're weeping over time that they misuse the time. They spent it with the wrong people. They were not with their family. They were not in the church. The misuse of time. That's what they cry. They weep for. If you wonder what it is, Hezekiah is in the Bible. There was a king in Israel. 
When he, they announced that it's time for that, set your house in order, your time is gone. What did he pray for? More time. And the Lord heard him and gave him 15 more years. But the beauty about time, you notice, all of us have the same amount of time. The difference is how we are using it. That's what sets one man different from the other, how you're using the time. All of us have the same amount of time. No technology can increase your, no, the amount of your time. Technology can only help you to achieve more results with the same amount of time. Do you know, the most effective way if the enemy is going to attack us, the one of the things is, is, first of all, tap us with our knowledge and mastery of the use of time. When the first attack comes with your knowledge and understanding of time, if the devil can tamper with that, he got you. He got you. He got you. And I was reading this scripture and I saw it. What did the locusts eat in Joel chapter 2? Do you know what the locusts ate? In Joel chapter 2, I told you we we're going to be in scripture. In scripture, Joel chapter 2, verse 25. Can you read with me? So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the crowing locusts, the consuming locusts, and the chewing locusts, my great army have sent among you. What did the locusts eat in Joel chapter 2? Was it things? Was it talent? Was it skills? They ate years. They ate time. So God's solution was to restore what? Time. I will restore to you the years that the locust and the canker worm and all the caterpillar, the King James Version, but all it was different kinds of locusts. The years that they have eaten. That's why when the Lord wants to bless a man, he restores you time. In a short amount of time, you accomplish what people could not do in, in their whole lifetime. I've seen people in two years, they accomplish things people needed 10 years to do. That is the working of the Spirit of God in the life of believers. When people see that, that's undeniable evidence of this power that we carry. The speed, supernatural speed and accuracy. I know it. I'm speaking it. I know 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 it. There was a time when I went through a desert season and experience when the Lord wanted me to come to a point where I have to depend solely, know him as my source of provision. And I've known that. Not an employer. Not a, nobody is my source of provision. My provision is from God. I respect all employers. I'm not being, I respect you. But if you just try to make, don't just make me angry. Because if I'm angry, it's going to be terribly bad for you. Terribly bad. <laughs> you know. Don't make me angry, you know. It's going to be terribly bad for you, you know. And it's the same thing with all of us, right? It's all of us. So when things were not working for me over that day, that season, for about five years, I was not anywhere. Uh, my stories, if I tell you some of them, you, some, I don't know how some of them will sound to you. It depends on your, the stage in your spiritual growth. But I had no job during a significant period of time. And the Lord was providing for us so that I know that he is my source of providing. During that time, my friends and my colleagues who were in, in, in graduate school had gone. They had gone. Some had international organizations. I will not glorify the names by calling the organization. They are there. In, some are central bank, uh, government econ economists, and so on and so forth. I was nowhere. I was in the wilderness. Do you know when he brought me out of the wilderness, in under five years, I rose from... from it's a, a, an entry point into a university to become a full professor in under five years. He rest, they usually take 10 years for you to enter into the university system. It takes a minimum of 10 years to rise to the full professor. But in five years, I did it. Speed. He restored the years. Supernatural speed. Nothing is lost with God. And so when I call you to prayer, I'm going to ask you to redeem the time. I'm going to show you how we redeem time. So let's look at those two words Two important words for our understanding today. There are two notions of time. The Greek word uses two words. Kairos, which means it's an opportune time. That's why I tell you, that's not every time is not the right time for God. There's a Kairos moment, an opportune time, a season, a defining moment, a life-changing opportunity, your Kairos. Kairos. Then the other one is called Kronos. The chronos is just the passage of time. The sequential movement of time, like a clock is ticking. 60 seconds lead to one minute. One minute, 60 minutes lead to how many? 
<laughs> one hour. 24 hours lead to one day. So it's just a sequential movement of time, the chronos. Now, in that chronos, sequential movement of time, there are kairos moments inside it. Would you discern your kairos moment? Hallelujah. Will you discern your hour of visitation? In that chronos, would you discern? What is your Kairos moment? I'm grateful that I'm speaking to many young people. Parents, I want to give you a big shout out for you are helping, making sure that your teenagers and youths are coming to church. Thank you so much for what you're doing. That's an investment for your spiritual ministry. As parents, you have a ministry to bring up your children. So I'm glad to see their faces there. Those young men and women, I'm looking at them here. They are mighty champions that I'm seeing. You don't know what you, you, don't know what you set yourself up to come listen to me. Somebody who God has lifted up and said, hey, lift the world and come serve me. I'm here to raise champions. I'm here to raise spiritual giants. You listen to me, come week after week, you're going somewhere. You're going somewhere. Many of you in this country, you maybe have come from parents from different continents, but you will stand in the legislatures, in the executives of this country that we're talking about. You're going to stand there and hold the cup. To whoever is making decisions. Let not your friends tell you we are wasting your time going to church. Why don't you stay? Let's play video games. No. Tell them, let them play. I'm not going to waste my chronos. I'm going to invest it because there's a kairos moment. There's an, a season, a moment of visitation. So why is this distinction important? And why, that was my burden for this message. Why does it matter that there is kairos and chronos? Why? Why does it, who cares? <laughs> Why should we care? Why? Because as I was praying and wondering this, why is it that some God-sized dreams are taking so long or proving so hard <laughs> to realize? Why is some of your God-sized dreams taking too long? In my search for solutions or answers, that's when I realized that I need to understand the difference between chronos and your chronos moment, the sequential use of time, and the seasons of visitation. If you can teach the people to master the seasons, to understand the seasons, the seasons, the hour of visitation, they're going to, like this, keep leaping from up and forward. You keep going upward and forward. As the Bible says, the path of the just is like the shining light, shining brighter and brighter on to the perfect day. You ought to be winning continually. You ought to be winning. There should be more testimonies. We've heard that testimony over and over and over. We need more new testimonies. Hallelujah. We need new testimonies. How many of you believe that God is in the business of blessing his people, lifting them up? We need to hear your testimonies more and more. So that's one of my burden for preaching this message. Failing to descend the hour of visitation, that's why some believers are stagnating. Or they are walking around the same wilderness over and over, turning around the corner because they didn't descend the hour of visitation. Hallelujah. I'm so intrigued by some 200 men in the Bible. They call them the men of Issachar. The men of Issachar. <laughs> These ones had an understanding of the times. They had an understanding of the times. And consequently, they were given authority over their brethren. Hey, I'm reading it from the Bible. Do you want to go there? First Chronicles chapter 12. First Chronicles chapter 12, 32. Could you want to read with me also? Of the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were 200, and all their brethren were at their command. You see that? They were put in charge of their brethren. Why? They had an understanding of the times. They knew what Israel was supposed to be doing. So, of the sons of World Mission Christian Fellowship, who had an understanding of the times, to know what God is doing at World Mission Christian Fellowship, to discern what is God doing at World Mission Christian Fellowship at this time. The sons of World Mission Christian Fellowship would discern that time. And what will happen? They will be in charge. Hallelujah! They will be in charge. Those who have understanding of the times. I don't, time will fail me to talk about blind Bartimaeus. Time will fail me to talk about him. But let's talk about people who are not able to discern their Kairos moment. We're not able to discern the time of, of the Lord's visitation. Were there in the Bible some people who miss out on their Kairos moment? Who are not able to discern 
what God was doing. They lacked understanding. What was the example? Jacob. Jacob. Our friend Jacob was running away from his brother Esau. After he cheated his brother of bed right, right? Of his brother's bed right. And he had now his father's blessing. But he couldn't stay because his brother Esau was planning to deal with him. So the guy was running away, going back to his mother's family. He was running away desperately. He got to somewhere. He was tired. And he picked a stone, a large stone, the Bible says, and laid on the ground and put his head to sleep. What a position to sleep. A head on the stone. The Bible says, as he put his head on the stone, he fell asleep, and he heard, he saw in a vision, a large ladder, a long ladder, from the earth getting to heaven. And angels were going up and coming down. He woke up from the sleep. Hey, so God was in this place. <laughs> Surely God was in this place, and I know not. You see that? You don't know that? You think I'm inventing this story? I'm not a dramatist. It is in Gospel of, is it Gospel? The book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 28, verse 16. Read it for yourself. Then Jacob awoke from the sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not even aware of it. Oh, so is it possible that the Lord visited World Mission Christian Fellowship, and some people were not aware? In the midst of the music and the sound that was not at its best, it's possible that there's a visitation and somebody was not aware because they are wondering, why are they, why, why are they singing like that? Why is the sound like that? When there's an hour of visitation. What was the consequence? If you just think, if it was just about, oh, God was in this place, then I didn't know. Were there consequences? Huge consequences. Jacob went to that journey. He went and met his father-in-law, uh, someone who became his father-in-law. The guy abused him, cheated him, abused him. He worked for slavery for 20 years. The Bible says he worked for 20 years unfairly. He, he, got, he saw a woman that is, he wanted to marry. And by the way, he was going on that journey to go marry somebody. Your father said, don't marry from this land. Go get married in the land where my, your, your, we come from. So he was following an instruction. Is it possible to follow an instruction and you still cheated? He went there. Laban gave him another wife. It's possible. He, he ended up marrying two women. <laughs> he wanted one. They gave him a fake one. Then later on, they say, walk again for seven years. You can get the real one. Then after he was serving that man, the man was just cheating him and cheating him. All because he missed a Kairos moment. 20 years of wasted time. I'm now going to tell you, when he started heading back to the land of Canaan, I'll tell you how he corrected this mistake. Hold on for this mission. Hold on. It might be taking long, but this message is important to you. We'll see how Jacob on his way back, when he got to that place better, he corrected the mistake. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. But it suffices to show you that the guy missed out and the consequence was 20 years of wasted time and the guy, you know, just get cheated, defrauded, and all sorts of things going on with him. What is the second example of somebody who misses the quietest moment? You know the lame man at the pool of Bethesda? You know the lame man at the pool of Bethesda? How I many of you know that story? This guy has been at that pool, at that place for 38 years. 38 years. He's lame. He wasn't born lame. I checked it in scripture. There's no evidence that he was born lame. So it was an infirmity that affected him sometime in his life. He ended up lame. Now, he was always at a place. He knew something. That there was a pool by Bethesda. They, by Jerusalem, Bethesda, they called it the pool. Something supernatural is about that pool. And when I go to Jerusalem, I want to go back and go check that pool. The pool of Bethesda. How many of you want to go to Israel? We can walk on that. Hallelujah. Oh, many of you want to go to Israel? Oh, yes. Then I can launch on, I can launch on the program for this church, for participants there. I can take you and we're going to walk the Bible right in real time. Hallelujah. I'll begin working on it. I see many, and I'm very excited for you. So at this pool of Bethesda, something that was happening is that once or sometimes the spirit of an angel will just go into that pool and shake the water 
Just shake the water. Then the first person who dived into the pool was the one who was healed. Now, it, not everybody who dives in the pool will be healed. It just is the first person. I don't know why it was so specific that way. So it happened that this man, according to his complaint, when Jesus saw him there, and noticed that he has been there for a very long time, he asked him, do you really want <laughs> to, to hear? The man didn't say yes. <laughs> Go check it. He didn't say yes. He started complaining. To tell you his life, he started complaining. I don't have any man to carry me and put in the pool. Before I want to move, other people have already moved ahead of me. Now, when I read that story, you might think that this guy was just disadvantaged. But the Bible says the people who were at the pool of Bethesda were all broken humanity. They were crippled, they were lame, they were blind, a rendezvous of broken folks. So there was no person able body that would take advantage of him. A blind man was also incapacitated as much as he also was not able to work. But he's saying that these other people had people to carry them to the pool. Me, I did not have. The excuse is valid. But the question is, how did he get to the place where he didn't have anybody to look after him? How did he get there? <laughs> you, know, you know, so many things, you know, all kinds of excuses people make and they think they can just get away with it. Now, the most important thing is, let me, there's so many messages you could preach from that. But let's not distract. Let's stay there. The Bible says the word crowd. Let's see that scripture. See, today I said we're going to read all the scripture. John chapter 5 from verse 1 to 3. Let's read with me again. Afterwards, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holidays. Inside the city near the sheep gate was a pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, laid on the pool. Let's go forward. Verse 5 to 7. He said, one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus knew and or saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, that what time there is chronos, the sequential passing of time. He has been there for 38 years, a long time. How did he start? He went to that place saying that in two months, he would jump into the water and be healed. Two months became seven months. Seven months became one year. One year became two years. Two years became 10 years. 10 years became 15 years. 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, 38 years. 38 years. Chronos. And there are Kairos moments in those times. But the guy is missing all of them. <laughs> and Chronos is going 38. Hmm. Jesus asked him, would you like to get one? He says, I can't. Say. <laughs> For I have no one to put me over in the pool. When the water bubbles, someone else get ahead of me. I have already explained it to you. The emphasis here is that he kept missing the Kairos moments. So the problem with him was not really that he lacked knowledge. This man did not lack knowledge about how, how to get healing at some times. Because at that time, they knew some pool. There was a pool where some people can go healed. So it was not knowledge that he lacked. Hallelujah. I'm telling some people at World Mission Christian Fellowship, it's not knowledge of the Bible that you lack. You might have the knowledge and still be for 38 years. Shh. You might know to quote all the scripture, but still be in that situation for a long time. It's not the knowledge that was lacked. He knew. He knew exactly what the, the people needed to do. They had to be the, jump in and be the first. So it's not knowledge is the problem. Hallelujah. Yeah, am I preaching now? This is the core of the message now. The hour of visitation is not knowledge dependent. It's not knowledge. De knowledge is useful, but it's not it's that put you over. He also knew. Everybody that was there knew what to do. But some people got it, others didn't. Hallelujah. So is it possible? Being, being in the right place, again, he was in the right place. He was by the pool. He was there waiting for the time the angel is going to turn, stir the water. So he was in the right place. So being in the right place was not even also enough. Being in the right place was not only enough. So you can still be a member of World Mission Christian Fellowship and you're still missing the hour of visitation. Is it possible? 
Is it possible to be an active member of World Mission Christian Fellowship yet continue to miss the hour of God's visitation? Is it possible? Yes, you might say that, well, uh, how, how, can, how can I make sure that I don't miss the hour of visitation? Someone will say, no, I need to be present at church. Yeah, okay. You can still be present at church today. Are you sure you're not going to miss the hour of visitation? What if you came in at when I just started preaching the sermon and, and the hour of visitation was during the worship moment? Huh? Is that possible? Is it possible that the hour of visitation might be during Sunday school? Hey, you... You think you cannot be, you are so wise and certain about the hour of visitation? What are the moments that we have created at World Mission Christian Fellowship? According to Kronos, we've set out Mon Sundays, 10 a.m., Sunday school, service starts at 11 o'clock. God honors that. He could visit us at 11 o'clock. And you came to church, you came later on. And later you celebrate and dance with people, but you were not in the hour of visitation. 11 to 1 o'clock. He creates another moment during when he's a Bible study. You are too wise. The God cannot come there. I'm going to go get, get, get my money. I'm going to go. I have my work hours. Good luck. Good luck. May God bless you. May He bless you richly, abundantly. Okay? That's, those are Kairos moments. Last Friday, prayer night moment. Those are the defined times our, in our chronos. He chooses what time he wants to visit. The Kairos moment is embedded in those chronos moments. You can pick and choose whatever you want at your own peril. No wonder many are said they are believers. Their lives have no grace, no grace at all. They change the world, the same things that the world do, the same methods. The, the people in the world are cheating to get ahead. You also cheat to get ahead because there's no grace to take you ahead. There's no grace to lift you. You only have to do what they do. And shame on you, hear me, church. Shame on you. If you are a believer and you are applying the same rules of the world, shame on you. The Lord authorized me to say that. Shame on you. He said to the Christians in Galatia, shame on you, you foolish Galatians. You started up in faith by grace, and now you want to walk it out by your own self. Shame on you. He said it in the book of Galatians. Foolish Galatians. Respectfully. But this is the word of God coming to you. This man has no authority to say that. If you think I'm saying it by myself, you got it wrong. The Holy Spirit speaking to you. What makes you think you know precisely the hour of visitation? Did David, you hear last Sunday, did David know that his hour of visitation was going to be on the, on, the, on the battlefield? When he was killing the beard and the lion, did anybody cheer for him? Did anybody even know that he was killing the, the beard and lion? Did he even know that he's carrying food? He's, he's taking food to the, to, 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 to the brothers in the war field. That was going to be his Kairos moment. You think you know. May God deliver you. Deliver you from that false sense of confidence. What about Joseph? Good example of somebody who sees their Kairos moment. Joseph. Let's talk about Joseph. Then we'll look at the principles for seizing your Kairos moment. I'm preaching good. Example of Joseph. He sees the Kairos moment. Oh, Joseph, you know the story of Joseph. I'm not coming here to repeat the story for you. You know how his brothers threw him in the pit. Somebody found him and carried him to a strange land. In the strange land, somehow they brought him to the house of Potiphar. In Potiphar's house, Potiphar put him in charge of everything that he owned. Everything except his wife. So everything I have is under your authority. Of course, you know your limit. <laughs> no cross. This is the only thing you don't touch. My wife is not under your control. Every other thing is under. But that very wife is the one. That's what he wants from Joseph. He kept making advances to Joseph. Sexual advances to Joseph. Joseph kept refusing until one day it happened. The woman tried to force him. Tried to rape him. The guy ran away. But the woman got a grip of his dress. As evidence. Presented it to Potiphar. When Potiphar came back. I told you about this Hebrew boy you brought into this house. He has been trying to rape me all along. He has been in this house. Today is the evidence. Look at him. 
to pieces, but Pharaoh was so disappointed. But I know he didn't believe his wife. Because if he believed his wife, the consequence for Joseph would have been that they would cut his neck to kill him. But because he didn't believe his wife, but he wanted to be political, he sent him to prison. Joseph is in prison 12 long years. 12 long years. Somebody came into the prison for, for something, and they had a dream. A cup bearer and somebody. Joseph again interpreted dreams for the people. That what this is what your dream is all about, blah, blah, blah. And it happened exactly as Joseph said. That man was released. But Joseph told him, my, my friend, you know I helped you with this dream. When you go, please tell Pharaoh that I'm in this prison unjustly. Tell Pharaoh. The guy went and forgot. He left and forgot. What does that tell you about the arm of flesh? Trusting the people in the world. What does that tell you about it? They will fail you. They will fail you. Somebody cannot bring that mighty deliverance to you and you go, you forget. For two years. He only remembered when Pharaoh got into trouble. Pharaoh was dreaming dreams and seeing cats, fat uh, cows, seven cows, seven tiny cows, fat, seven fat cows. The, the, the tiny cows swallow the, big, the, the fat cows and they still look the same. He got up and is frightened. He sleeps. He sees the dream again. He sees all sorts of things. He was frightened. He called all his magicians. He said, come tell me the meaning of this. Dream. Nobody could tell him. Pharaoh was so worried. Then that's when the cup bearer. Oh, Pharaoh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know somebody who can give us an answer to this dream. Two, you remember when I was in prison two years ago? I met a boy there. Oh, look at what make him to remember. Very selfish. Say, let him call Joseph. Let me tell you, this is a Kairos moment for somebody now as I speak now. When they call Joseph to come interpret Pharaoh's dreams, one of two things could happen to, to Joseph. I'm not interpreting any dreams anymore. I'm not interpreting any dreams anymore. What is it? I'm interpreting dreams and I'm in prison. Nobody is coming to I'm not interpreting. Who tell him? Go tell Pharaoh I'm not interpreting any dream. One scenario. Is it right? Does that look like the attitude of that man for 38 years at the pool? Does, doesn't it look like that attitude? Joseph could have had that same attitude. I'm not interpreting any more dreams. Forget it. Or, the second scenario, he could say, okay, yeah, let me go. Let me go. When, when, the, when he came in front of, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, please, before I interpret your dream, I want you to first know what the situation where I'm in. I've been in prison for unjustly. Can you call Potiphar and his wife to come and confess in front of here? He might come, he may have come there and started bringing this wahala. He would have brought his wahala in front of Pharaoh. I'm not interpreting any dream until you hear the truth about why I'm in here. What would have happened? Pharaoh would have listened. He said, oh, oh, I'm sorry. He said, you have an accent. Where do you come from? He said, I come from, from Hebrew. My parents came from. So, oh, sorry. We'll send you back to your country, to your parents. Isn't that one likely strategy? A foreigner who comes here and gets himself in trouble. We'll just send him back to where he came from. Joseph determined not to let his past hurts determine his future. Little did he know that appearing before Pharaoh that day, the next day he became prime minister. No election. He became from prisoner to prime minister, head of government, authority over the whole land. Overnight. Overnight. By exploiting a Kairos moment. Overnight. Overnight. I tell you about speed. Overnight, when God does it, my goodness. Ooh, Joseph, you like that. You like that. But Joseph could not have done that if he didn't know how to discern the times. So, Les, I'm giving you steps now. The steps to discerning your Kairos moment. Hallelujah. We are like in a convention today. So forget about the movement of the time and all of that. We are in a convention. We are purposely about to discern our hour of visitation. So I'm giving you the key steps now. So where are we going to copy the example of somebody who knows how to discern the Kairos moment? 
wouldn't be the example of the person who had missed it before? Because for Joseph, you might say it was predestination. Many of you like that kind of talk. You would say it was predestination. Let's see the guy who missed the Kairos moment and how he had another opportunity, what he did differently. Wouldn't that be a, bet, a, best, a better tempo to, lead, to read from? So I'm giving you the, tempo, the template of Jacob. Let's go see how Jacob, when he was returning back, when he was returning back to the land where his parents had lived, what he did differently. And as we read those scriptures, I'm going to be giving you step number one to descending your Kairos moment. And you'll be writing down or taking note. Hallelujah. So this is where we're ending the sermon. We're ending it with going through the steps. I'm going to give you four key tools to descend your hour of visitation, your Kairos moment. And we're reading from Joseph, from Jacob's template. Sorry, Jacob. Jacob, the guy who missed the Kairos moment, he had another opportunity to redeem the time. And he did it right. Genesis chapter 32. Let's go. Read with me so that you know that we are working together. Genesis 32 verse 1 to 2. As Jacob started on his way again, angels of God, take note of the things that I highlight. Angels of God came to meet him. When Jacob saw them, he exclaimed, this is God's camp. So he named the place Mahaniam. Okay. Key number one. To descending your Kairos moment. This is usually an unusual activity and presence of angels. Unusual activity of angels. In fact, he noticed that on the first time, on the first lake, angels were climbing the ladder, going up and coming down. He didn't know what it meant. This time he sensed it. This time he sensed it. When he saw the angels of God, ah, my mama ain't raised no fool. I know this thing. I know what is about to happen. I know what is about to happen. Key number one. There's usually an unusual activity of angels or presence of angels. Oh boy. Peter also had an example of that. When we changed his theology. Remember Peter? He thought that the gospel was only for the Jews. What changed his, his theology dramatically from Jews to Gentiles? When he saw in that vision before he went to Cornelius' house. He saw angels. Coming up, whenever there's an unusual activity of angels, know that you're approaching your Kairos moment. Hallelujah! Key number one. Hmm. I have three more. So, and the same one is about any. Hallelujah! You've already got key number one. Then key number two. Let's go to continue reading Genesis chapter thirty-two from verse three to five. Read with me. Then Jacob sent messengers ahead to his brothers Esau who was living in the region of Seir, in the land of Eden. He told them, Give this message to my master, Esau. Humble greetings from your servant, Jacob. Until now, I have been living with Uncle Laban. And now I own cattle, donkeys, flocks of sheep and goats, and many servants, both men and women. I have sent these messengers to inform my Lord of my coming, hoping that you will be friendly to me. Let's continue reading. Take note. Let's continue reading. Genesis, continue, sorry, 6 to 8. After delivering the message, the messengers returned to Jacob and reported, we met your brother Esau, and he's already on his way to meet you with an army of 400 men. Jacob was terrified at the news. He divided his household along with flocks and herds and camels into two groups. He thought if Esau attacks one group and, and, and uh, uh, he meets one group and attacks it, perhaps the other group can escape. Let's continue. Verse 9, 9 to 10. No, take note of verse 9. Then Jacob prayed, O oh God of my father Abraham, and the God of my father Isaac, O oh Lord, you told me, return to your own land and to your relatives, and you promised me I would treat you kindly. I'm not worthy of any of your unfailing love and faithfulness that you've shown to me, your servant. When I left home and crossed the Jordan River, I owned nothing except a walking stick. Now my household fills two large camps. Let's continue verse 11. He says, Oh Lord, please rescue me from the hand of my brother Esau. I'm afraid that he's coming to attack me along with my wives and children. But you promise me I will surely treat you kindly and I will multiply your descendants until they become a numerous as the sand along the seashore. Too many to count. Key number two to descending your Kairos moment. There's usually an unusual sense of gratitude and an urgency to pray. 
Notice that there's a sense of urgency. Lord, I came only with a stick. Now I have so much gratitude, a sense of gratitude. And he prayed. And this kind of prayer is usually accompanied with fasting. Persistent, long fasting and prayer. So, key number two to descending your Kairos moment. When you have that unusual sense of gratitude. And an unusual sense to pray and to fast and to wait. Hallelujah. That's key number two. Right there. Let's continue. Then, continue. <laughs> Let's read. You saw that you see where the keys are coming from. It's not a man-made doctrine. Genesis 32, verse 13, he says, Then Jacob stayed there, stayed where he was for the night. Then he selected these gifts from his possessions to present to his brother. You notice that? The gifts, they are naming them now. 14,200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 elves, 20 lamb, rams, 30 female camels, with their young, 40 cows, 10 bow, bulls, 20 female donkeys, and 10 male donkeys. Jo Jacob thought to himself, I will try to please him by sending gifts ahead of him. Yeah, when he, I see him in person, perhaps he will be friendly to me. So the gifts were sent on ahead while Jacob himself spent the night in the camp. Key number three to descending your Kairos moment. There's an unusual sense to give sacrificially. Unusual sense to give sacrificially. That's exactly when Abraham got it when he laid his son Isaac, his only son, whom he loved. He laid him on the altar. That was the Isaac test. The test of giving sacrificially. That is when you're descending your Kairos moment. In this church, by the anointing of the Spirit, God told me to teach this church how you become, you walk in the blessings of Abraham. You never make it anyhow significantly in the kingdom of God if you don't pass this test. Can I tell you this? I like it. I say it respectfully. And it's good to serve. You can serve in any ministry department and do very well. But when it comes to trusting you, trusting you with the true riches and power, not just power, trusting you would influence over, over, over God's agenda and his programs, you need to, he needs to see what is in your heart. <laughs> I myself, when I was growing up as a believer, I thought I was going to be a kingdom financier. I'm going to just be very successful in the world and, and I'll, I'll, I'll give money, pump money to the church to advance God's program. You know what he asked me? When I got the only little resource that I needed to live is a giving. I didn't know, and I did it. So, I hear a word of Rema to somebody. You are telling yourself, I'm sponsoring the gospel. I'm going to, if I do my business, I succeed. I'm going to sponsor the gospel. Here is it. It is a good dream. But watch it. You're going to pass the test first. If you say you are a kingdom financier, you're going to finance God's kingdom. The first thing is going to happen. God's going to cause a contract to come your way. A lot of money is just going to come to God. Then when you receive it, you have the money was to expand your business or build a new home. He says, no, bring it to me. God said, bring it, give me that one. Now, that one. You, you argue and cast and bind. That is not the voice of God. He's the one asking you to bring it. Bring it to me. You know why? He will not trust you with anything. Because the last time he trusted somebody with money, the person disappointed him. The last time he trusted somebody, a treasurer, in his team, he, he got disappointment. What makes you think that you can't trust you? Are you kidding me? Talk all you want. Many of you will reach to heaven with no dream fulfilled. If you want to fulfill it, you're going to pass this test. Whether you like it or not, you've got to pass this test. Or you never do amount to anything. Key number four. Genesis 25. 22 to 25. During the night, Jacob got up. Now, look, the final one. During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two seven wives, and his 11 sons, and crossed the Jabbok River with them. In the night, somebody's taking his children and crossing the river. In the night, after taking them to the other side, he sent his possessions over. Then verse 24 says the word, This left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him. Until the day dawned, be, until day began to break, isn't it? Let's continue. Verse 25. It's a very interesting story. When the man saw that he would not win the match, 
he touched Jacob's hip and wrecked it out of his socket. Then a man said, <laughs> let me go for the day is breaking. Ah, ah, ah. Jacob said, ah, 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 ah. I missed this 20 years ago. No, 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 no. no. You must bless me before you leave. You're not going to leave. You must bless me. This is a Kairos moment. I cannot carry my children and wife and go keep them over the river in the midnight to be here for this Kairos moment. And you come, you want to go and leave me in this state. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Did I lose the microphone because of excitement? Let's try to get me back to the sound. Let's try to get me back to the sound, take team. Thank you so much. It was my fault. Too much excitement. But he has seen this before. He has seen this before. How it costed him 20 years. Said, no, you're not going to leave if you don't bless me. Then the man says, what's your name? The man asked him. He replied, Jacob. So I see why you have been suffering for 20 years. Now your name will be called. <laughs> you are no more Jacob. I'll call you Israel because you are the one to inherit the promise. Hallelujah. And because you have fought with God and you fought with men. And you prevailed. Let it be said of you that you fought with God and you fought with men. And you prevailed. Then Jacob, the man wanted to go. Jacob also asked him, can you tell me your name? The man said, ah, Really? My name, <laughs> I'll see you in heaven. <laughs> Hallelujah. Key number four, final key as we close. Discerning your Kairos moment, there's always an unusual sense of consecration. Usual sense of consecration. To get out of people. Sometimes even your spouse, you want to just be alone in that Kairos moment. That's what he did. He sent his wife and children away that night because he didn't want any distraction. No distraction when it's time for my Kairos moment. No distraction. An unusual sense of consecration. So summary, as the sermon is ending. Summary. What are the four keys to discerning your Kairos moment? Key number one, there's an unusual activity our presence of angels. Key number two, there's an unusual sense of gratitude and urgency to pray. Key number three, there's an unusual sense to give sacrificially. To take and pass the Isaac test. As we've heard, the Isaac test is actually a process of removing idols from our life. Removing idols. As long as idols are there, not much God is going to do with us. Key number four, designing your Kairos moment. You, there's always be an unusual desire for consecration. For unusual desire for consecration. I've come to the end of my message. Hallelujah. Yes, 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 yes. But there should be an altar call. After you hear something like this, you don't go back. You don't go back or begin to figure out what should I do. I'm going to provide you a template of what you do when you listen to something like this. This is life-changing message you've heard. If you're going to take these four principles and work on them, you're going to discern your Kairos moment. You're going to walk into seasons of blessings. Seasons of blessings. Hallelujah. I'm going to skip the altar call for the unbelievers. But many of them may be watching me online. Oh, I'm talking to believers primarily. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is useless to you. So Jesus Christ has already paid the price. Have you received your gift? Have you received your God's salvation gift? It's a gift. Have you received it? What have you got to lose? What have you got to lose? He paid it all with his own blood. And all you need is to believe and accept and receive. So if you want to receive wherever you are, say, Dear God, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. I believe in him. I believe in the work of the cross. And I believe that my sins have been forgiven by the work of the cross. I now accept Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. I receive eternal life in my spirit. Today, I'm born again. I'm a child of God. If you said this prayer, God will in no way cast you away. Hallelujah. Amen. And let us know if you made that decision through this ministry because we can actually help you in your next steps. But I have an altar call for you, the believers inside this house. Your altar call. Can you just hold on for me a minute? I have something for the believers. What you need to pray before you take the communion. We're going to go really fast for the remaining items.
But the most important thing is not all those ceremonies we have inside the church. It's for people to receive what God proposed for them. Please, even the ushers, I know that you're about to serve the communion, but make sure you're listening to what this altar call because it's for you also. Do not miss your Kairos moment in the service. What I want you to pray, you believers who have been listening to me, Psalm 102. Psalm 102 verse 12 to 13 says, But you, O Lord, shall endure forever, and the remembrance of your name to all generations. Verse 13, you arise and have mercy on Zion for the time to favor her. Yes, the set time has come. You're going to just the time to favor you at Royal Mission Christian Fellowship. Now that you know the four keys to discerning your Kairos moment, the Lord is telling you today, here is the set time for me to favor Royal Mission Christian Fellowship. Number one, many of you have missed your Kairos. For the wasted chronos. You wasted the chronos and you miss Kairos moment. Ask for mercy. Because it's mercy that will give you back that time. It's mercy. The remedy for, for, for missed opportunities is mercy. May the Lord have mercy on you. You're going to ask God to have mercy on you for the times that you miss his visitation. I think we should pray on that first before I go to the second one. Yes. Continue uh, with the music. Come on. It's a prayer. Pray. Pray, World Mission Christian Fellowship. Pray, you online viewers, pray. Ask for mercy. Ask for mercy. Shaba Rababade, Solomon Rababade. Hallelujah. Well, Mission Christian Fellowship. May the Lord have mercy on you. Open your mouth and ask for mercy. Ask for forgiveness for the time that you pass by your hour of visitation. Oh, Lord, have mercy on your people. Have mercy on the people of World Mission Christian Fellowship. Have mercy for the missed moments, for the missed hour of visitation. Oh, arise. And I'm faithful on them. On what we should be separate you. Sada Baba Bade Baba Buddha Rasha. Sada Baba Bade Bada Shala Dabba Bade. Sada Bade Bada Shala Bahada Dabba Bade. Dana Nana Masida Baba Bada Baba Bada Shala Dabba Bade. Buka Dabba Baba Masida Dabba Baba Bada Bade. Bulu Guru Di Dabba Baba Shala Bade. Dabba Baba Di Kau Dabba Baba Bade. Oh Sala Baba Baba Bada Baba. Hallelujah. The second prayer topic before you take the communion ask for wisdom and grace to redeem your chronos. As you spend your days, your days, make sure that you're redeeming the time, not being unwise, not being foolish. You're maximizing each day. And so that you can accurately apply these four keys. To season your Kairos moment when it shows up. It's wisdom and grace that will help you. Let's pray again along this line. Sabari Basuta. Pray while Mission Christian Fellowship. Sabari Babu Salabade. Dabare Babade Salabade. Lama Dolo Salaba Salabade. Nantala Baba Babade Babo Salabade. Nantala Babo Salabade. La Kalabadi Salaba Baba Babade. Oh, you can begin to give them the communion of it, the communion. Yes, can you begin to serve the communion while they are praying, please? Serve the communion while they are praying. Samarabade. Continue to pray for grace. Grace, 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 grace. And wisdom. Oh, Yeah, 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 yeah. Go, 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 go. 
of time you can we take the communion now at this stage now I hope you have made right the word of God came with instructions with correction I hope that there's no offense in your heart to the word that was preached there is possible that offenses come then make it right before you come to the Lord's table because that's a, a, a big danger for anyone to come to the Lord's table not discerning his body. Any anger, any hurt, keep it aside or skip the communion for your own good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, you are all invited to come to the Lord's table, but there are conditions for it to come to communion. Not discerning the body of Christ rightly can cost you a lot. Premature death, sickness. So discern the body of Christ accurately. If you are hurt by the word that has been preached today, ask God, please, Lord, help me. Help me. I want to obey your word. I don't want to be angry at the man of God. He didn't write the word of God. You wrote it. I'm not angry with the man of God. I'm not even angry with your word, Lord. Your word just taught me how to live right. That's the attitude you need to come to this table. If you have that attitude, break the bread this is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was broken for you for your sake eat it now and those of you watching online you could also break bread biscuit or anything and participate in this moment and as we eat there's also a drink Jesus on the night that he was betrayed he took a cup and he gave thanks and told the disciples that this, is, this cup represents my blood, my blood of the new covenant. Remember, every covenant is ratified with blood. So my new covenant is ratified in my blood. And by the blood of Jesus Christ, we are made members of God's family. And the Bible says the blood of Jesus continually cleanses us of our sins. Drink of this cup with that knowledge. This is a prayer moment. I want to ask the worship team to lead the church in a, a short moment of consecration and prayer. Ask God of anything that you have in your heart. Ask him at this time. You need to ask yourself. Ask for God whatever you need. Worship team, can you lead us in a short moment of prayer? Yes, Lord. Come to the stage, worship team. Come up to the stage. to say that this is also a time that you could bring your tithes and offering freely, no, not under composure. If you want to give to the Lord today, there's an offering basket, there's an online channels. For those inside the sanctuary, there's, own, there's a basket, but there are online platforms also. But prayerfully pray about this. It's not more about the offering than about your heart and what God wants to give to you. 